I am particularly pleased that Nicholas Dirks and Claude Steele have agreed to uh, talk with us today about this critical topic, undergraduate education in the public research university. I'm going to give a very brief introduction because I think most of you know the chancellor and the provost. Um, uh, Nick is the 10th chancellor of Berkeley. He's a renowned historian and anthropologist who focuses on India. Before he came to Berkeley, he was vice president of arts and sciences and dean of faculty at Columbia. Um, uh, Claude came from down the road at Stanford. He's the dean of the school of he was the dean of school of education at Stanford, and he was also at Columbia as provost. He's a social psychologist. He works on identity issues, particularly the self-image of minority students and its relationship to performance. Something was relevant to some of the presentations we heard earlier today. So I'm going to begin with a question that is um, simple but fundamental, which is what do you each think should be the purpose of an undergraduate education in the 21st century? <laughs> you usually go first, and then I get in your tracks. So let's let's keep, that, keep that partnership going. <laughs> yeah, the first thing I want to say is I'm just uh, I'm thrilled that, uh, that Carol and, uh, and, and, and others here have put the effort into creating this opportunity to talk about undergraduate education in, in the public university. Uh, for the last uh, three years uh, since I've uh, been at Berkeley, and I came here, as Carol said, from Columbia, uh, I have been uh, uh, thrilled to be part of one of the world's, uh, one of the country's greatest public universities, uh, to have the opportunity uh, to lead it, but also to, uh, uh, to, to, to have to think through what it means to talk about a public university at a time that is very, very different both from when public universities were established, for the most part in the late 19th century, although the University of California kept spawning them. Uh, but, uh, but now, in a, and then of course, uh, uh, having watched the way in which they became so critical to the ecosystem of, uh, of research universities in the United States during the 20th century, but now in the 21st century, a time when funding uh, uh, from the state uh, would suggest that we're actually at least more than half quasi, more than half public, if not more than that, uh, and of course, uh, with a whole variety of constituencies that that demand uh, from uh, from from public universities uh, ever more uh, in every conceivable direction. But the focus on undergraduate education is is central, and in my view, it's it's also central to the the mission. Uh, it was central to the mission in the beginning. It's central to the mission now, and the uh, of course. Uh, the strength of a place like, like Berkeley, I taught uh, uh, not only at Columbia, I've taught at the University of Michigan. The strength of these universities, these great public universities, is that they've established uh, top leading graduate programs, uh, as good as any, and any, in some instances better than uh, most in, uh, in not only uh, uh, other universities, but, but in private universities. But the challenge has always been how, how, to, how to create an opportunity for, for undergraduates, which uh, both parallels in, in, in quality uh, in terms of the experience and in terms also of the learning uh, of what is available in, in smaller private, not just universities, but colleges. But how to do it in a way that also leverages the, the extraordinary strength of the university at large. Uh, and I think we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit about that during the next hour. But in terms of what, what, what we, we are looking to to do as educators for our students in this new century, I think uh, I'd just say uh, a few things. First, I think we are still uh, we are still tasked with the fundamental mission statement of the liberal arts and sciences. <laughs> that is, of course, something that's evolved over time. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep going backwards in time. I'm a historian, so I do that. But, uh, <laughs> but it is, it, it's, it's evolved over time, and it's changed in, 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 in fundamental ways. Uh, and of course, it's also become sedimented in, in very different kinds of uh, uh, resolutions in different universities. And, uh, and so the, the, the history of undergraduate uh, education and the theories of undergraduate education, in some sense, get uh, get displayed if you take certain institutions and you use them to say 
you know, Columbia uh, core curriculum started in 1919, uh, ended in 1947. That's sort of what uh, uh, what happened there. Uh, Brown, uh, in some sense, uh, going from the Harvard uh, experience of introducing the elective and then stressing choice on the part of students. Uh, you know, I went to a, I went to Wesleyan University, which uh, I went there the the first year that both parietal hours were disbanded and uh, distribution requirements were uh, were were disbanded. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know what parietal hours are, you're 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 a lot younger than I am. But uh, but you know, it, the emphasis was on choice, was on the the student crafting their own path, uh, and of course, then uh, achieving their own end. But but it seems to me that critical thinking is, is, is more important than ever, and I think most educators agree with that. Uh, and yet the question, of course, is what does that mean? Uh, and how does, it, uh, how, how does it get translated into a new curriculum and a new time? So one of the things we've done here at Berkeley uh, are, as part of our undergraduate initiative, which we launched uh, when I came here three years ago, and I've been working with some of the people here in, uh, in the audience, and I've been struck by uh, already how much has been done uh, and the goodwill uh, and uh, extraordinary ideas that are propelling us uh, towards, I think, uh, ex what are, are going to be uh, really important contributions to the discussion across public uh, education. Uh, uh, but what we've been trying to do is, 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 is to find some things that we can introduce that students will have in common. And it's not so much content as it is a set of aspirations around uh, uh, areas of learning. Uh, and of course, uh, the end uh, really being the capacity on the part, part of students to continue to learn, to learn how to learn so that they will uh, enter uh, their postgraduate life uh, with a capacity to continue to move through the dizzying pace of change taking place with, uh, uh, with respect to virtually all parts of our lives, whether you think about changes in technology, whether you think about the changes associated with globalization, uh, whether you look at some of the challenges that, uh, uh, that we have from climate change to global inequality. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, flagship universities uh, see themselves doing all sorts of things, but one of them is, is actually educating the leaders of, of tomorrow. So what, what does that entail? And the one substantive example I'll give of something that has been introduced by our faculty here is a pilot course that is growing both in size and, uh, and I, I will say also in success, around data science, data analytics. And the notion has been not so much to teach uh, coding or standard computer science, although a lot of our students, of course, are seeking that education, but rather to teach a kind of critical numeracy to think of critical numeracy as, in some way, an extension of critical thinking in an age in which so much of our uh, knowledge world is driven by not just data, but very large sets of data, uh, and very large sets of data that then get uh, interpreted or translated into uh, propositions about us as consumers, about us as citizens, about us as voters, about us as uh, uh, members of an urban community, uh, us as drivers of cars and traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we, we know, all of us here know, because we work with data, uh, that data is not, that, that algorithms uh, that work with data sets uh, are themselves uh, interpreting those data sets. And we know that data sets have been constructed out of uh, a, a non-neutral uh, reality. That is to say, they themselves uh, have a particular, uh, take a particular slice uh, of the world. And they take it in ways that obviously uh, <coughs> fact-based, we all talk about fact-based, evidence-based, but that uh, have to be understood in terms of the, uh, the, the, the constitution of those data sets as much as in terms of what you do with them. And we're trying to teach that to all of our students in ways that will then connect with how they envision their own interests and take their own electives. So I'll stop there. Do you want to add anything? Well, I, I, uh, I, I'm a psychologist. And so perhaps my general thinking about that question is, is shaped by that, that perspective. I, I, I do see uh, the college years as a, as a developmental period in a person's life, and that in part we're as institutions tending to that development. And there are a lot of things you, you hope people uh, gather, uh, uh, critical thinking, uh, some capacity at self-examination, some sense of, of, of 
where they fit in the larger world and what the larger world is and what what the what the 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 values are that are, are critical to to uh, uh, their their lives and so on. So I, I do think there are a lot of skills that we that we that we think of that are very implicit that a, a good university and a good university experience uh, helps to helps individuals to develop in a good way. Uh, I also think it's it's a time when people. Uh, hopefully, when it operates at its best, when they, they fall in love with something, that, that a, a, a course of life, a path of life, uh, and certainly a path of work, uh, but a, a learning, investigation, they, they really get excited about something, and, and that you begin to take on that kind of an identity as well as the other identities that you've always had that, you, that brought you into that situation and that, that are going to be a, 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 a part of you. Something else gets added as a, as a critical uh, north star for, for, for you, uh, and that that can lead to a profession. That can lead to many things, of course. But uh, I, I think it is a, it is a, a, an opportunity in a person's life where where, where the, if if that happens, it's a, it's a very good thing. And uh, in in relation to, to public universities, I think uh, our research uh, opportunities, especially can be helpful in, in developing that kind of thing. People can see inside a line of, uh, uh, of, of work and scholarship and research, and, and that tends to be a very exciting uh, avenue of access to things that is, is, is more exciting than, than what, what they can read in a textbook or what they can prepare for in taking a, t a, a test. So that, that experiential uh, uh, offering we, we have, I think, is a powerful part of, of what a, a, a major public research university, or really for that matter, any research university can offer to, to undergraduates. I, I can go on, but I'll stop there. No, that's really interesting. I want to um, expand on what, you, want you to expand on what you just said, because I, I, it sounds like for you, um, an education in the 21st century is very much, or maybe it always was, about identity formation. Mm -hmm. But identity formation, not in a very in a narrow sense, but a really broad sense that involves intellectual passions, um, uh, uh, intellectual experiences, as well as the things that we, um, in a more um, kind of common conversation kind of way, uh, associate with identity. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how that process of identity formation that you describe is distinctive in a public university hmm. as opposed to another kind of campus. Hmm. Or perhaps it isn't, but I'm, I'm really interested in getting at what are the dis, is the distinctive character and perhaps the distinctive challenges. That's, a, that's that. an interesting, you know, because I, I wouldn't say I see a major difference between uh, uh, public private or liberal arts major research universities in that regard. I think all of them provide this, this opportunity to, uh, for identity development and, and to take on uh, a new identity that's going to steer your life uh, and in all kinds of ways, structure your life in all kinds, your relationships, your, your, your profession, your income, <laughs> lots of things will flow from the kind of identity formation we're, we're talking about. I do think big public universities have a challenge in uh, accomplishing it. It, it's, it maybe is a little easier for some of these things to, to take hold. Uh, for, first, let me, let me say, I, I think uh, it happens, it's, it's scaffolded by good curriculum, uh, interesting professors, contact with faculty, contact with, with uh, uh, mentors, uh, access to, to scholarship and research, things that are going to be exciting. Those are the things that scaffold this kind of identity formation I'm talking about. So I would, I would then take that lens and say, how does a public university, uh, does it have challenges in uh, sustaining that scaffolding? Uh, that maybe some other universities have a little bit easier time doing. Uh, uh -huh. Because we have large numbers. Uh, I know you've been talking about faculty-student ratios. We have uh, a, a many things that challenge that to, to, to some degree. But uh, we do have great strengths. And I, I was point, point, pointing first to those, the, the, the amazing, if, if, you can, 
if you can hang in there, <laughs> you're, you're, go you're going to walk into uh, one of the most exciting wonderlands of research and scholarship that you could ever uh, imagine on a campus uh, like, like, like this. So we have huge strengths. I, I think we've done a lot of thinking about how to make those first two years years that give people a common enough sense of, of themselves uh, and a sense of what's, of what's at stake here in their college lives, that we, we as a big university can help steer them into these kind of experiences. Yeah, yeah just, just to add a little bit, but uh, this in fact does grow out of conversations, again, that we've had not just with each other, but with many of you here uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, you know, the scale, uh, provides the kind of excitement, in fact, that uh, people want when they go to cities. Uh, and uh, more and more young people want to live in cities, uh, you know, and we see, that, uh, we see that very clearly here in Northern California. Uh, but in a way, what, 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 what the university, uh, what the public university provides, whether it's in uh, Bloomington or uh, Berkeley, uh, is a kind of scale of interaction, at least within the space at the campus, that has that buzz of an urban center and, uh, and, the, and the diversity and the opportunities and the interactions are, uh, are, are incredibly uh, valuable and I think actually do provide a counterweight to the kind of individualized attention that can be provided at a smaller yeah. liberal arts college, right? Yeah. One, uh, one of the, uh, I think, odd features of our, our college and university life is that from the moment a first year student comes in the door, you are trying to convince that student that belonging to this particular university, whether it's Hiram College or it's Stanford University or it's Columbia University or the University of Michigan or Berkeley, means something fundamental to their identity. Yeah. You know, you become a, you know, um, for Smith, it was a Smithy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm interested in what that affiliative moment means for a public. Is there something different in the identity that students either take on or you're asking them to take on when they walk in the door as opposed to going to a Stanford or a Columbia? Is there something <laughs> distinctive about the public nature of things or not? It That's could be not. You know, I have a cynical thought that comes to mind. <laughs> uh, at, 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 some universities that, that that forming that kind of an identity, a sense of that university being a part of, of who they are and a, as a lifelong identity, it's part of the financial model. Let's oh, of course, <laughs> of course. But maybe that has to become more and, of the financial model yeah, here. And that's maybe a little different at, at Publix. Maybe uh -huh. that's a difference. We haven't. We, we we often talk about this. We 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 do need to uh, to to emulate our private peers, um, mm -hmm. perhaps more in developing that kind of an identity in, in, in our public uh, universities so that they do have this sense of, of, of uh, uh, being that, you know, being part of this institution and being responsible for the institution uh, over the course of their, their lives. That's a, uh, so we, we've certainly had, it, had that conversation coming at it from that angle. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I I, I think I've, I've found uh, uh, here in California, uh, not just because of Berkeley, but because of the whole UC system, uh, a recognition of uh, of the value of a public institution mm -hmm. qua public. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, that is different even from what I experienced mm -hmm. at the University of Michigan. Uh, now you know, big chill, we know uh, mm -hmm. Michigan. Uh, Produces a huge kind of uh, a sense of identity and loyalty, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and they also are raising a lot of money these days that way. But uh, but but you see, uh, the public university has been so much a part of the history of the state mm -hmm. that I think it's a little different. It's a little different. And so people are, uh, and this is true for students. It's actually true for faculty. They're much more self-conscious about coming to a public vis-a-vis -a, -vis a private. Yeah, I think that's right. And. You know, I, I, I really think that inflects everything we do at the institution. And it, what it, among other things, occasions then is precisely that question, what does it mean to be in a public institution? Mm -hmm. And especially now, what does it mean, as I mentioned when I was uh, reflecting on your first question, what does it mean at a time the state isn't really paying for it? Because, you know, students 
are providing through <laughs> tuition the single largest revenue source for the operation of the university, mm -hmm. even if it's a lower tuition than the privates. Mm -hmm. So both of you mentioned scale as one of the great challenges of the big public flagship universities. What are ways of mitigating the kinds of disadvantages of scale? Well, lately, it's, it's, uh, before I answer that question, I, I think we should be proud of scale and, <laughs> and the fact that yeah. we do such amazing scale with um, uh, such really modest resources in some, in some way. I think that, that, that reality isn't <clears throat> as pr appreciated about us in the larger public discourse about higher education. And we have you know, a faculty here roughly the size of, a, of an Ivy League faculty, mm -hmm. but we, we do educate. Uh, offer the opportunity for a first-rate education to uh, maybe three times as many or more than that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't charge, you know, 40% of them don't pay tuition. I mean, there's it is, it is quite a story to tell about the achievement of, of major public universities and their efficiency at providing high-level education uh, opportunities to, yeah. uh, to, to students. And that's something we struggle to get out there. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm probably primed to take any opportunity I can to, to, uh, to get that out there. And, and I think for, for us, the, the, we have done a, been trying to do a great deal of thinking about how to mobilize that scale to create a kind of an experience that uh, mm -hmm. ushers uh, students mm -hmm. into this wealth of opportunity in a big university uh, like, like that. And as, as Nick was saying, uh, earlier to, to create a, a sense of common experience in, in, as early as we can in, mm -hmm. the, in the undergraduate exp, uh, experience, a sense of common intellectual identity, general intellectual uh, a mission in life that, mm -hmm. uh, that's built on critical thinking, that's built on seeking uh, knowledge and information, that's built on curiosity, that's, that's built on the, that, that set of, of, of academic values that, that, that are core. To get that in there very quickly, Other, in, 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 in big publics, the, 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 the rival pressures are uh, you come into a big place and uh, you learn what it's all about from uh, just the people who are most immediately around you. And it may, it, that, that may lead you into a frame of mind that causes you to leave a lot of opportunity on the table, yeah. to miss a lot of what's really there. And I think that's one of the big challenges of, of, of public uh, you ask how we do it. I think that the, that's the challenge, and how we do it is, is to, in, in our case, is to try to programmatize, institutionalize this common experience. But, you know, again, the, the, the challenges are, are huge uh, in doing this, and I think we have to acknowledge that. Uh, you talk about scale, and uh, I want to add to that. Uh, again, everyone from Berkeley uh, knows this and is proud of this, but uh, a third of our students, our undergraduate students, are Pell Grant eligible, which means they come from families making less than forty-five, fifty thousand dollars. And uh, you know, when uh, when you actually even look at other public universities, the University of California is uh, very, very uh, uh, strong in in that kind of socioeconomic diversity. So you yeah. both have a lot of students. You also have a lot of students from uh, from very difficult backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, now that actually produces, in turn, uh, in some sense, greater challenges for the university, because you have people without necessarily the same kind of educational background or cultural capital or mm -hmm. uh, social experience that allows them to immediately hit the ground running when they come to Berkeley. Many people, uh, many students come here, it's a dream to come here. But then once they get here, it's very daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that, that's, and to give, again, an, a, a sense of scale, if you take UCLA and Berkeley together, the two uh, routinely top-ranked public universities in most of the rankings, uh, and you look at the number of Pell Grant students both institutions have, that's more Pell Grant students than not just the entire Ivy League, but the top 15, 16 uh, private colleges and universities in the country. That's uh, Ivy Plus with Chicago, Stanford, Hopkins, Wash U, and a few others. Uh, but um, but that is a huge kind of uh, 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 opportunity, but challenge. So one of the things in, in thinking through a common experience intellectually is, is precisely to provide opportunities and, and channels, really, for students to engage each other across often very different kinds of social, ethnic, 
<laughs> racial, even national backgrounds. Uh, but we also have recognized that we need to think about not just the intellectual identities, but we have to actually think about where students live. What is the residential experience? How does advising help students uh, make connections between and among different segments of life? And all of these are often uh, administrated, as it were, in separate uh, 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 domains. And so connecting them, uh, as they have been in smaller private institutions, is a challenge, but it is uh, something we're working on and thinking about uh, and trying to uh, fashion a plan for that will work at this scale. And even in a context where we know uh, that almost all of our undergraduate students after two years will probably live uh, off uh, campus housing, trying to create identities uh, with houses and, and, and dorms and, and residence halls that might actually continue wherever they might live throughout their four-year career. We've done some um, speaking already about student-faculty ratio uh, in this um, conference. And of course, one of the uh, characteristics of public research universities is they tend to have larger student-faculty ratios than their private counterparts. Do you think that student-faculty ratio is always an index of quality? Uh, not for us to admit to that. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I was going to see which our, one of us was going to say that. First. Yeah. <laughs> our our uh, our mission is to um, is is to find ways that that use the scale to uh, sort of electrify the undergraduate experience that, 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 that take, take advantage of it, that, that create such a strong and varied and interesting uh, undergraduate community that, that uh, with so many options that you get, you get the positives, you get the excitement and the, uh, and the sense of possibility. Uh, for, it's like living in New York. Let's mm -hmm. say, or San Francisco, or mm -hmm. where where there, there's huge scale that itself has a very inspirational, generative uh, uh, dimension oh. to it, uh, and and we do feel that here mm -hmm. that you know in, in in this this is this is a big powerful place with a lot of, uh, of of good energy, and and our our aim is to to harness that in ways that make it not because it's so easy to stereotype it as the as the alienating experience of you know a student in a class of 750 far away from the professor and with no sense of 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 connection to it uh, and that's what scale yeah. is but scale can be something else too but you know we we uh, you know we would like to have more uh, faculty uh, there's not a department in the world that doesn't think it would be better if it wasn't bigger uh, and uh, and certainly every every department here uh, uh, feels that way. And the strain on, uh, uh, on on departments and on faculty is significant, and it has to be commented on. I think the the thing that uh, I've been impressed by both at uh, at Michigan and at Berkeley, however, is the extent to which faculty uh, really do take their teaching seriously. And some of them, you know, take the lecture hall uh, as a stage. Uh, a stage in which they establish a different kind of relationship with students. But, you know, from uh, Robert Reich to Randy Sheckman, uh, uh, we have performances that, uh, you know, Broadway would be envious of uh, every day, every day. And of course, then we rely on uh, advisors, we rely on graduate students, we rely on lecturers, we rely on uh, a variety of instructors. Uh, and uh, we've been working very hard as an institution to provide training to all of those uh, different groups and to engage them in the, in, in, in the process of undergraduate education in a meaningful way. Now, the truth is that if anybody's from Harvard here, uh, uh, close your ears, but the truth is that you know, a lot of students go to Harvard and they, you know, they, they, they have their primary interactions for the first couple of years are with TAs as well. It's not just the publics. Uh, but I think that there is a, uh, a kind of recognition that this is hard, uh, but that it's fundamental to the, to the, to the mission we have. Uh, and I really have been impressed by that. And this is, again, you know, I, I mentioned Randy Sheckman, he got a Nobel Prize uh, uh, two years ago. 
uh, he was in the press conference uh, talking about the prize, and then he said, I'm sorry, I have to go. I'm teaching a freshman seminar. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, again, not every freshman takes uh, a Nobel laureate, uh, it takes a seminar with their, their Nobel laureate, but it happens enough that it becomes then part of the lore, part of a kind of generalized experience, and then in turn becomes uh, the basis on which, and we see this every year when we give our distinguished teaching awards, uh, you have alums who come back and say, you know, that professor changed my life. And you get that here with uh, the same kind of regularity. You get it at uh, the Smiths or the Wesleyans. I uh, ask a question on a different topic now. Um, uh, Chancellor Drix, uh, globalization has been very important to your vision of what you want to do at Berkeley. And I, I wonder if you, could you talk about that in, um, in relationship to undergraduate education in comparison to uh, many privates, a fairly small percentage of Berkeley students study abroad, about 6%, I think. Um, and uh, so, so how do you uh, take that vision of globalization and make it inform undergraduate experience? Well, you know, it, it is certainly the case that uh, we have very active uh, study abroad programs, both at Berkeley and through the UC system. Uh, but they still reach a very small percentage of students, as you said. Uh, and it's in that context that, uh, that, that I began thinking about uh, other ways, perhaps, to, uh, to make sure that students have some experience of globalization. So one of the kinds of core competencies that we've established in regard to thinking around the curriculum and uh, or curricular reform vis-a-vis -vis the undergraduate initiative is to, is to make sure that some kind of global uh, competency gets uh, introduced into, into a curricular experience. That's not us alone, but we, we I think, uh, recognize across the institution uh, that uh, the globalization means for students graduating in the 21st century uh, that there's a much higher probability that they're going to be doing some part of their lives, whether they're working in business or a nonprofit or, uh, uh, or te uh, technology or uh, what have you, they're going to be working both uh, in global context and they're going to be working with people from all over the world. Uh, but we uh, also, in uh, thinking through how to use the Richmond Field Station campus, which is 10 miles to the north, have envisioned uh, some future day when we can have the Berkeley Global Campus that will uh, regularly bring uh, uh, faculty and students from around the world uh, at greater levels than you can bring in through international student uh, admissions and the campus directly. Uh, and for shorter term stays, part time uh, uh, you know, semester, even a couple of weeks in some cases. Uh, and in time, we hope we can introduce into the mix uh, opportunities for our undergraduates to do everything from uh, short-term courses to internships that will, again, confer on them uh, international experience. But it will be a different kind of global study, say, than you know, the year abroad in France. We still have the year abroad in France. I mean, that's, that's great. Uh, uh, but uh, we have to think uh, out of the box, but, again, particularly at this scale, uh, if we really want all students to have both some curricular exposure and some experience of the global. So the idea there is uh, if you work even as an intern with, uh, with a technology firm that's thinking about uh, scaling up in, uh, in Southeast Asia, you have some <laughs> serious way to engage the cultural, social, economic, political kinds of questions that would be part of that uh, through the internship and its relationship to how we're both exposing students to and engaging them in courses with some of the critical global issues of our time. One of Berkeley's most important core values, this is going to be my last question, then I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. One of Berkeley's most important core values are, is diversity. Um, what are ways in which both of you think that the university can make the diversity of its community a learning experience for all students? Well, I, I do think diversity is a huge um, underappreciated resource in our general society and, and I think also on campuses um, uh, in my science I've seen diversity 
of the scientist add tremendous breadth and depth to the science because people bring in different perspectives and mm -hmm. and uh, I, I like to to help students see that that is everybody's bringing something to the table and and belongs in that regard that your your particular perspectives can be uh, very helpful, very useful in expanding uh, the enterprise of scholarship and research and, 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 and the like. So uh, I think there's a way to, to present it that, that, can be, uh, make, it, it, that can be empowering and help people really see their sense of, of connection to the, to the enterprise. Uh, and in that, in that, you know, I think a more typical, a, a lot of the research I've done in my, li my life has focused on how that can go awry. Uh, I, I come into a, a, a university setting and I may feel because of general views of my group, stereotypes about my group's abilities, for example, I may feel some threat, some sense of disease and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, don't, not belonging in the situation. And that can make me so vigilant and worried about that particular identity that I can't get to the task of forming this other identity that is sitting at my feet as an opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, and so that that dynamic is something I've I've, I've thought a, a a good deal about, and is a challenge of diversity. That that's that's it's mm -hmm. diversity is such a, a port, an, an important uh, strength, but uh, we want to get better at solving this other problem so that that it can be fully empowering to 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 everybody. Yeah. We were talking particularly about, um, about this morning, particularly about the um, attrition of underrepresented minority um, students in STEM. I know that's a subject that you thought about, and I wonder whether there's anything that you would like to add about, particularly about the STEM issue and the fact that about half of the um, underrepresented minority students that begin university expressing the intention to major in a STEM discipline um, drop out a very substantially greater percentage than um, majority students. Yes, I, I, I think that these identity dynamics I'm talking about play a much bigger role in driving that phenomenon than we generally appreciate. We think of instruction as almost entirely a matter of, of cognitive preparation and so on. And this, I certainly did as I got into this research. But, but over time, you, be, you, you begin to realize that if you feel like you're not being perceived uh, uh, well, or as promising, or as belonging, and you're you're vigilant. You're you're analyzing cues in a situation because you want to know what how people is is your identity mm -hmm. is your identity uh, an issue here. Uh, that's a very distracting and and laboring uh, onerous kind of thing, and it and it can pressure you to seek another easier path of life. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it, you know, women tend to leave those fields not because their grades are bad, but they, mm -hmm. their, their, the relationship between their performance and whether they stay or leave is, is almost, the correlation is almost zero. Whereas for men, if we leave those fields, there's a very high correlation. We haven't done very well, and so we're leaving. Uh, so that, that bespeaks a, a statistic like that, the, the role that, that these identity dynamics can, can play. And I, I just don't think we have been, it's very difficult for we, us Americans to, to um, want to take on issues of identity. We kind of want to reduce that away out of the picture. <laughs> Uh, and to understand the problem in, through a different lens. And uh, that, that, that is, that, that's kind of where we're at. I, I think we adults, we leaders, have to be more open to the role that these things play mm -hmm. and, and begin to uh, address them, take advantage of them. Uh, and and I, I think we'll see some changes in, in uh, our, our patterns of participation. Uh, that, that we worry about so much. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to open it up to you for questions. Um, hi, I'm Candace Till. I am a 
I was abandoned by Claude at Stanford University <laughs> for bringing me there. Um, uh, you, you and, but I know what, <laughs> but, I, but it was okay because I know one of the major reasons is exactly the conversation we were just having yeah. around uh, coming to Berkeley, and which is my alma mater, so I also forgave him for that point. But um, but coming to Berkeley to make it a model flagship university for essentially for inclusive excellence, and I'm curious. Um, in the time that you've been here, what kinds of actions have you taken to create that? And what have you learned from those actions that would be instructive to the rest of us that are trying to create environments of inclusive excellence? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I, there's, there's that drinking from a fire hose phase, which uh, <laughs> uh, I think I'm beginning to get out of a, a little bit. Uh, so uh, I, I offer that as an excuse for maybe not having made as much progress as, uh, as, as one might aspire to. Uh, but but I, I think both of us are, uh, this is one of our, our uh, the primary priorities. Uh, we have focused on a lot with Kathy Koshlin, who's sitting there with our with an undergraduate initiative that is trying to to uh, uh, put in place uh, w one concept, one term for it is a Berkeley College that will have both. Uh, the kind of curricular dimensions that, that Nick was describing, but that would focus on pulling the undergraduates together in, in, a, in, a, in this new identity, forming a, 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 an academic, more um, you know, curiosity-driven, critical re to, 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 to do more to concert that identity in, uh, in our uh, first two years of, uh, of experience at, at Berkeley, and, th and not let those two years of experience be sort of laissez-faire, Guided, uh, and in that way, our hope is that we uh, will will begin to to see some of these uh, un unwanted identity dynamics uh, uh, reduce in the impact or lower in the impact they, they have on the on the course students that, uh, take as they as they go through Berkeley, uh, and we, we and in order to do that, we, there are there are parts of this this initiative in, in addition to curriculum. There there are threads through the the, uh, uh, it's, it's a vertical program, so there are threads through the, the curriculum to the second, third, fourth year uh, that, that give people uh, a, a sense of order and where they're going and, uh, and, and make that, that, set of that, that kind of decision making easier. And then there are also things in the residence halls. We have them for their, for our, only for our first year here. They're in a dorm for our first year and then, and then they're dispersed, so we need to make that first year an, ex an experience where, again, this other identity uh, becomes the common shared identity that makes it, it that makes some of these other dynamics less of a, less problematic in in, in some ways. Uh, so, I'm, I'm giving you theory more than what we've actually <laughs> accomplished, but but th but that's how we're thinking about it. Hello, my name is Sarita Alexander. I am staff here, an analyst after being an undergraduate and a graduate student here at UC Berkeley. Um, and my question has to do also with diversity and creating an inclusive environment for students. We have over a half a decade of worth of data um, from our UQ's uh, surveys showing that um, undergraduates are experiencing negative um, Ex their, their ne negative experiences are coming from other undergraduates as opposed to from teaching staff, teaching uh, instructors or staff. And um, our colleagues at the University of Minnesota presented yesterday at this conference sharing similar results. And our UCY campus climate uh, survey results showed the same thing, that it's this peer-to-peer -peer, um, exclusion that's happening. In our survey, our Berkeley campus climate survey, we actually asked about exclusion from study groups. And we found that a large proportion of African-American students, as well as transfer students, were reporting that they had been excluded from a study group as a result of their group membership as either a transfer student or an African American. So I'm wondering what um, what you all plan to do as part of the undergraduate initiative to create a more inclusive environment um, focusing specifically on undergraduate um, training of some sort. I know that faculty are going through something. The GSI Teaching and Resource Center are teaching GSIs on how to handle these kinds of conversations in the classroom. But what's actually going to happen for this peer-to-peer -peer interaction that's happening? Uh, boy, it's a it's a daunting uh, a, 
a problem, and uh, I think it is, is 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 quite a serious problem at Ber at Berkeley. The data show it over and over again. We're not the we're not the only university that has it. Uh, I know the data from big publics. I don't know the data so well from from uh, our private peers. Maybe it's maybe it's different there. I'd like to think that that uh, when you have the infrastructure you need to create a more cohesive community, you get less of that. I'd like to to uh, think that that is, is the case. But uh, again, I appeal to, I appeal to the, the, the larger mission of the initiative is to uh, uh, deal with that directly. Uh, I, and I, I can't claim at this point that we have taken that on as, an, as explicitly as we should. Because uh, I, I think to some degree, at least, at least I think in both of our experience, it's, it's, there's been a, a growing realization of how important it is. Uh, and how central it is to the experience of undergraduates. We have an obvious critical mass problem uh, with uh, African American uh, students and with Latino students too. We, that, and that is true throughout the, the UCs. I think it's true, uh, true throughout the f flagship publics these days. But especially in states like Michigan or California where you have, you, you ha you have no affirmative action. And, and a as the critical mass goes down, uh, you, you're, you're now a member of a much smaller minority, uh, and, and, and uh, you just feel like that is more of a factor in your experience maybe than you've ever felt before. And um, it, it puts you on the, on, on, in a vigilant mode, a worried mode, and you're, you're, you're having to kind of sort through what does it all mean all the time. That is allocating an awful lot of energy to to uh, uh, understanding and coping with that uh, experience that can't be devoted to to uh, the the curriculum and task at hand, um, and there there are a host of intervention programs. There's a growing literature. We have a lot of we have ourselves a good a good number of uh, uh, of programs, but uh, I don't think we I could claim at this moment that we have a genuinely integrated approach to that pro, uh, to that problem because I do think it involves both. Uh, working with the students involved, and I think with the with faculty, a lot of these things and comments that are that come up in uh, these surveys are actually made by faculty in in in, real, in relation to uh, student groups. So I, I think the whole community is going to have to be engaged in in and awakened and engaged in in dealing uh, with this. I could go on in this vein, but I. I, 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 all I can do, I, I think the best I can do at this point is to, to tell you how, how uh, uh, serious an issue I think it is. Hello, my name is Matt. I'm a grad student. I also did my undergrad here, um, and I'm a proud transfer student. And the question I have in this kind of this whole debate we're having with the room is how do we better bring in the transfer student experience, especially for students who miss really the, the, the first two years of our OSCE formation? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OSCE formation, I like, uh, I like that. Uh, I haven't heard that before. Yeah, you know, one of, uh, just to go back again, uh, most of you know this, but uh, one of the parts of the master plan as it was constructed in 1960 by the university in partnership with uh, at that time, Governor Brown. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, some things change and other things don't. But uh, uh, was the notion that, uh, uh, that we would aspire as a system to take a third of our students as transfer students. And it's been a remarkable uh, achievement, and it continues. Uh, it's not quite 34% across the whole system. Berkeley is uh, somewhat lower, but it's still a substantial number. Uh, and although, again, if you start looking at the actual data, you see that students who transfer to Berkeley actually don't come from all the community colleges. There are some in particular that are almost like feeder schools, and some like Berkeley City College, which is right here in, uh, in Berkeley, has programs that allow uh, interactions of different kinds, students to begin taking courses up uh, on campus, uh, interns. Uh, to work in the schools and uh, familiarity to begin to uh, really be cultivated before the transfer moment takes place. Uh, you also know that uh, it's still a big walk up 
that hill. And if it's a big walk up that hill, it's an even bigger walk up from other community colleges. Uh, and we have, you know, of course, like other UC campuses, we have uh, uh, programs that are dedicated to working with transfer students. <clears throat> I've been concerned that two years really isn't enough. Uh, you know, as we talk a lot about the importance of these first two years, uh, we're talking about uh, the importance both educationally but also in a, in a, in a way uh, development, developmentally. Uh, but they're both part of experiencing uh, the breadth of this campus. And if you have to come and just insert yourself into your major program and do nothing other than what is uh, necessary to fulfill your requirements in a two-year period, you really are putting blinders on that make it impossible to take in uh, even a fraction, as other students are able to do, of what's available more broadly. And I think that is uh, a challenge that, uh, uh, that, that then you know, over-determines some of the kinds of challenges transfer students have. It takes already what are the struggles that uh, any transfer student, just by virtue of coming into an institution halfway through, will, will have. And I think that's true in any place where you transfer, although it's, I think, additionally true when you transfer from a very different kind of institution. Uh, and it, 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 it then enjoins us as an institution to find ways to, to deal with that. I mean, if I, if I had my druthers, I would find a way to both use summers and potentially extra semesters to, to build in a more compressed version of a kind of two-year uh, elective or core curricular uh, uh, preface to the transfer experience so that there would be not just OSCE formation, but that kind of Berkeley form, you know, we have, we have lots of different terms here. Uh, but one interesting one, just vis-a-vis -vis the question of undergraduates and graduates and research faculty and the like, is that many undergraduates will say they went to Cal. Uh, if you're talking about sports, you're obviously talking about Cal. Uh, uh, for the longest time, I would watch California play uh, sports when I was on the East Coast, and I, I didn't know it was Berkeley. <laughs> I thought, I, thought I, I, I confess, I thought it was just, you know, um, representatives from UC. I, mean, I, <laughs> I know a lot better now, uh, but, uh, but, the, uh, but, but the experience that, that, that you have that then predicates both the intellectual, uh, uh, the full intellectual accomplishment and also what we're sort of engaged in talking about here, not just identity formation in the reductive sense, but identity formation in the sense in which this place really does become part of your your being uh, in, in, in ways that empowers you beyond your particular major to, uh, to go on and take what you've learned here to, uh, uh, to be the foundation for whatever else uh, uh, you do uh, is, is something that uh, I think for transfer students is a, is a, special, a special challenge that, that, again, produces glorious results uh, because our transfer students uh, come in and they perform uh, spectacularly well. I hear faculty group after faculty group say uh, they actually uh, love the transfer students in particular because they are just so eager to be here, so uh, dedicated to, uh, to taking advantage of their time here. Uh, there's no sophomore slump for transfers, but you know, there's also not that opportunity to take uh, as much full advantage as possible at the campus. We have time for one more question. Who's on first? Um, I was interested in your comment earlier about trying to create a microcosm of a large urban environment in UC Berkeley's campus. And this morning we heard from Michael Jackson at USC who talked on one of his slides about specifically having uh, USC use Los Angeles as a living and learning laboratory, an extension of the campus. And so I'm thinking about sort of this sort of town-gown relationship. You look at situations like in Cambridge, Massachusetts now where between Harvard and MIT, they control more real estate than the actual towns do at this point. I mean, how, when, you're, when you're on the border of a large urban environment like San Francisco, you know, how much do you want to encourage the sort of cross and out of campus experience versus the in campus experience you know, to, to fully leverage the community that you're in, I yeah. guess is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed uh, Michael's presentation about what U USC has done, uh, which has done so much in the, in the world of undergraduate education. So uh, uh, we, I'm sure we'd have a lot to learn from that. 
But in terms of town gown things here, I'll start and then Claude, you can perhaps add, but uh, the t town gown is already, uh, it is in post-structuralist terms, always already part of the Berkeley student experience. <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, it's, uh, students come here, for example, a third of our undergraduates engage in community service of some sort. And they come here in part to do that, uh, because there's that kind of service mission that uh, I think is so broadly shared. Uh, students uh, will uh, uh, not only engage in community service projects, they'll get involved in, in other kinds of things, including uh, political uh, activities, but they uh, will in turn uh, to work in schools, uh, uh, both in Berkeley and elsewhere. And, uh, and you find them, uh, whether it's the Berkeley project that dedicates several Saturdays of the year to just doing kind of chores around the community to, uh, uh, to looking at uh, Berkeley students who work in Berkeley High or Richmond High or uh, high schools in Oakland, a real sense that you know, they, wanna, they wanna be part of the, the world. Uh, we have, uh, as, as one of uh, the dimensions of the undergraduate initiative here, we've uh, been focusing on arts and design. And one of the things that we're in the process of creating now is something called the culture pass. And a culture pass is the idea that every student, every, uh, every student at Berkeley will have uh, ways to take advantage, not just of cultural performances, uh, exhibitions, uh, events of different kinds on campus, but in the, in the broader Bay Area as well. And it's a way to get uh, students out. It's a way to make sure that there are experiences of the arts and in bro more broadly speaking design uh, as well. Uh, but that's a wonderful way to engage the resources of the community uh, more broadly. And of course, uh, the Culture Pass is trying to make that as inexpensive as possible for all of our students by both a co by a combination of subsidization through fundraising uh, with uh, basically uh, uh, block tickets being provided at, at very low cost uh, by presenting organizations that engage us in a long-term relationship. But again, that's just a, 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 two examples, I think, of, of, of where we are as a community. But, uh, but I do think that uh, uh, for many students, uh, the, the town uh, is, is really just as important as the gown. Claude, do you want to add? Well, I, I, this is, I think, one of the strengths of a, of a great big public university in an urban area, Oakland, Richmond, San Francisco, is the, the, the membrane between the community and the university is pretty thin here. Uh, and our students live in, out in the community and, and they, their values are, are shaped by that community as, as, as much as, uh, uh, as by the university. Uh, often, and um, so you you have a, a sense of, of 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 the DNA of a place like this being pretty, pretty uh, uh, enabling a, a very easy movement back and forth between be, between the inside and the outside of the institution. Sometimes we wish we had more ability to hold them in <laughs> and uh, do some more of the socialization ourselves, as opposed to having the broader world do it. But uh, but I, I I think the the publicness of this place. And this is a site of of. The Berkeley's campus, interesting to me coming here, is thought of uh, locally and regionally as, as a site where the public can express itself. And, and it, it, the public shows up to do that on a pretty regular basis. Uh, <laughs> yes, it does. I just want to add one last thing, though, to that, which is, of course, one of the big problems we have uh, with our town is it's getting uh, a lot of uh, wealth uh, injected into it from, uh, from the prosperity of Northern California. And what we're finding increasingly, of course, is just rental costs. I mean, students used to find it cheaper to live in uh, the open market than in our dorms, and now it's very uh, quickly become the other way around. Uh, it's, uh, that actually may be one of the biggest challenges uh, going forward if, uh, if this process of, 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 of uh, gentrification at the level that it's happening across the East Bay continues, and, uh, and then we'll have other kinds of things that we'll have to deal with. Well, please thank the Chancellor and the Provost.